So as every time we will start by revising the fort and stuff and then build upon what we have done in the last class. So in the last class we said that majority of people when faced with the following lottery height of the of this column means probability. So this means you get five cookies with probability one. So majority of people prefers five cookies with probability one to ten cookies with probability one half and losing everything with probability one half. And we said in order to reflect this phenomena properly that was tested with multiple experiments, field studies, and this was confirmed that people prefer five for sure compared to this alternative risky thing. So we have the green thing is risky, the blue thing is safe. So safe is you get this for sure and you get either lose or win with some probability. This is risky in a sense. So we said this is well captured by the utility function, which is concave. So if people have a concave utility function, then they will prefer five cookies for sure compared to 10 cookies with probability one half and zero with probability one half. And we said the following. Okay, let's assume that this is square root of C. There are different utility functions. But for this class, let's assume that this is square root of C. This is a concave function. So what does it, this function implies? It implies that if you eat zero cookies, you're zero happy. So square root of zero is zero. If you eat, on the other hand, 10 cookies, your square root of 10 cookies happy. So you're, you're happy, 3.16 units of happiness. Now, if you eat five cookies, then you are happy five, square root of five units of happiness, which is 2.23. And I say cookies, but usually people would say consumption good, and this is where C comes from. C is a consumption good. It's usually not money, because it's not that we are happy by holding piece of paper in our hand. We are happy when we consume things, cars, houses, whatever. Different people have different fetishes. So, on this chart, what can we conclude about our quiz? So, if we get 5 for sure, for sure we are going to get 2.23 units of happiness. Now, if we get 10 with probability 1 half and 0 with the probability of 1 half, we will get 1.58 units of happiness. Therefore, the concave utility function tells us that Five for sure, we get 2.23, 10 with probability one half, and zero with probability one half, we get 1.58. So we prefer the safe thing compared to the risky thing. But observe this utility function, as I said. And I told you, this utility function actually, actually gives you more. It, it, it contains more. Imagine that you are poor, that you have zero units of happiness. So if you have zero units of happiness and I give you one cookie, you will be one unit of happiness more happy because you will jump from zero to one and this will increase your utility from one to square root of one, which is one. So you will be one unit of happiness more happy. And now observe if you are rich, you have 10 cookies. I give you one more, what happens? Your utility increases just a slightly tiny bit. It goes from square root of 10 to square root of 11, which is much, much, much less than one unit of happiness. So this utility function, basically concave utility function, in some sense tells you, okay, if I give $100 to a rich man, it will mean much less to him than if I give $100 to a poor man. Poor man will be much more happy with additional $100 than the rich man. Rich man won't even feel it. So this makes sense. But now some people will tell you, yeah, but I love risk. You know, there are more and less risky people in this room, and I really love risk. I love this bungee jumping, I love this stuff. I love, you know, jumping from the airplane. I love the adrenaline pumping my heart. And, but this is not actually, 
in a sense, it doesn't mean that he is not risk averse. It doesn't mean that he loves risk, and we will see now why. Well, risk loving person would be described by a convex utility function. In the previous class, we have seen what is risk neutral. People that don't care about risk, they would be just a flat line. Now, people that love risk should have a convex utility function. So in the case of our quiz, that would mean that if you get zero, you get zero unit of happiness, it's zero to the square. If you get 10 cookies, you get 100 units of happiness. And if you get five cookies, you get 25 units of happiness. So for five cookies for sure you get 25 units of happiness and for one half you 10 probability 10 cookies plus one pro half probability zero cookies you get 50 units of happiness which is much more. Now the question is do these people in reality do these people in reality exist. If you offer somebody 5 million for sure and 10 with probability 1 half and 0 million with probability 1 half, usually people will not choose that. But also note that this utility function assumes more. This utility function assumes more. This utility function assumes that if you are poor, you have 0, you have nothing. I give you one more cookie. How much more happy are you? You are more happy one unit of happiness. You, are, you go from zero to one to the square, which is one. But now imagine that you have 10 cookies. You are rich. I give you one more. What do you get? You go from 100 units of happiness to 11 to the square, which is 121 units of happiness. Which means you are one cookie means more to you when you are rich than when you are poor. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That does not make any sense whatsoever. So usually, how do people that are more and less risky differ? They are all risk averse, but some are more, some are less. And this is described by some special utilities functions where you can change parameter. It doesn't have to be square root of C. It can be more complicated function. But let's forget, this is not important about for this class. This is just for you to know, and we will discuss it a little bit at the end of the class. Okay. So if you observe this chart, what do we learn from this concave utility function? We believe people have concave utility function. That means that you prefer something in the middle compared to something in the edges. You prefer something for sure compared to something more with some probability and something less with some probability. Now, let's move away from this extreme example where you can choose either something totally safe or something totally risky. Let's move to some more real life example, like investing into a stock market. Now this chart tells you what were the returns in market. So if you invest in all stocks in the stock markets, in every stock you invest a little bit f in different years. So in 1931, you would lose between 50 and 40% of your investment, while you would gain from 0 to 10% in 1926, 34, 39, 47, 48, etc. This is something that you observe in the market. This is what has happened in the history. This is historical data. This is what happened. And then we can say, okay, but this looks kind of like a normal distribution, approximately. If this looks like a normal distribution, then the measure of risk will be the width of this distribution, which is standard deviation, which tells us how wide this distribution is. The wider this distribution is, more events we will have on the edges, and the more narrow this distribution is, the smaller the standard deviation is, more events we will have in the middle, and risk-averse people will prefer that. If conditional that the mean is the same, we prefer the distribution of returns, which is, which is smaller. This comes from the fact that we are risk averse. Now, the, the same data plotted in a bit different way looks like this. This green line is the same data from the previous slide. It just returns plotted through the time. And we have observed this chart and we said, okay, it is obvious that stocks, the green line, moves much more up and down 
than the blue line, which are bonds. Bonds basically almost don't move compared to stocks. So stocks are riskier than bonds because they will give us more ups and downs. And we don't enjoy ups and downs. We would like to stay in the middle of our utility function, in a sense. We prefer one thing in the middle compared to one up and one down. We enjoy this more because our utility function is concave. Okay, but then the question is, why would anybody buy stocks if stocks are more riskier than bonds? Why would anybody buy it? What, what's the point of buying stocks? Well, stocks offer you more money. They offer you more in returns. If you invested $1 in 1926 and kept it until 2010, you would end up with $2,260. If you, on the other hand, invested $1 in 1926 into bonds, you would end up with just $20. And you can actually observe this difference across different countries. In the top chart, you will see the market risk premia in different countries. So what is market risk premia? This is how much more do you get if you invest in the stocks of this country compared to what you would get if you invest into bonds of this country. So for example, Italy has a market risk premia over time, with average market risk premia over time of about 11 percent. What does it mean? That means that if you invest into Italian stocks, on average you will get 11 percentage point more than if you have invested into Italian bonds. So if bonds were giving on average, I don't know, 4 percent, then the stocks on average were giving 15 percent. Now the bottom chart gives you the the standard deviation of returns if you invest into stocks in each of these countries. And you can see that there is some kind of a relationship, that usually countries with higher risk premium have higher standard deviation. In a sense, we are seeing in this chart some relationship between the risk and the return. We cannot say whether it's better to invest in Italy or Denmark. The fact that Italy offers more when you invest in stocks compared to bonds then Denmark doesn't mean that the Italy is better or worse. It just means there is more risk and de therefore they offer more return. But we still don't know what is the relationship between the risk and the return. And this is what we are going to discover today. The goal of today's class is to come to the relationship between the risk and the return. This is a Nobel Prize. The only Nobel Prize that you will learn in this school, I guess. I don't know. I don't think that you will learn any other. So, we said, if I hold a stock in my portfolio, if I hold one stock, let's say IBM stock, this is the only stock that I have invested, then the good measure of risk for me will be the standard deviation of this stock. And we said, here is how you calculate the standard deviation. So, Let's say that the first column, column number one, <coughs> is the rate of return in percents of, let's say, IBM stock over last four months. So in last four months or four years, let's say in last four years, if you invested in 2010 in IBM, you would gain 40%. If you invested <coughs> in 2000 eight you would gain ten percent in two thousand seven ten percent in two thousand six you would lose twenty percent or something like that these are observations that you observe in last four years of the return that you would get if you invested into ibm stock now what is the riskiness of this stock for you if you are holding only this stock well the riskiness will be measured by the standard deviation it will tell you how widely spread these returns are because you would like to have them as close as possible to keep the same mean. So how do we calculate the standard deviation? First, we calculate the average rate of return. What is the average rate of return? It's 40 plus 10 plus 10 minus 20 divided by 4. This is 40 divided by 4. This is 10, OK? So the average return is 10%. So what is the deviation from the average of these observations? First observation of 40%. How far away is it from the 10? It's 30 away. The second one, it's 10, so it's 0 away. 10 is 0 away from 0. The third one is 0. And the fourth one, minus 20, how far is it from 
from 10, it's minus 30 away from 10. So these are deviations from the mean. Now, what variance measures is average squared deviation. So let's put them to the square. What is the square of these numbers? It's 90, 0, 0, 9, 900, 0, 0, 900, okay? 30 to the square and minus 30 to the square, both are 900, okay? So this will be the sum of the square deviations. Sum of the square deviations will be 1,800. What is the average deviation? What is the average square deviation? Well, this is the sum divided by 4. So this is 450. 1,800 divided by 4 is 450. And what is the standard deviation? It's just the square root of the variance. So this is the square root of this number. Square root of 450 is 21.2. So the standard deviation of, of this stock would be 21.2%. Okay? This would tell us how wide this distribution is. Now, this is when we have one stock. Now we know how to calculate the return. We know how to cal what is the return of a stock. We observe it in the market. We know how to calculate the standard deviation of one stock. But usually people hold more stocks. You usually won't hold invest just in IBM. You will invest into 10 different companies. So how do you calculate first the return of, of this portfolio? Well, this will be just the weighted average of returns. So if you invest 10% in one company, 20% in company number two, and 70% of your money in company number three, then the return of this portfolio will be just 0 0.1 times the return of company one plus 0 0.2 times the return of the company 2, plus 0 0.7 times the return of company 3. So it will be just the weighted average. Now the question is, how can we calculate the risk of this portfolio? Well, I told you it's a pretty straightforward thing. It's a complicated, there are a lot of things that you need to calculate, but it's a straightforward thing. There are two ways, actually, how you can do it. You can observe time series of returns, and you can first calculate all the returns, historical returns of your portfolio. Then you can calculate deviations of these returns from the mean, and then you calculate the variance and the standard deviation. But you can do it differently. If you know standard deviation of each company, and you know their correlations, you can do it as well. And this is how you do it in this case. So first, let's say, don't get confused with what you learn in statistics. Because some students approach me and say, but usually with n in statistics, we know the number of observations. Here, n in this example is not number of observations. It's number of companies in your portfolio. So imagine that you have n companies in your portfolio. Imagine that you are investing into 100 different companies, IBM, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, whatever. So n in this case is number of companies that you are investing into simultaneously. So you are investing into n companies. How do you calculate the risk of the portfolio that consists of n companies? First, you create a table of the size n by n. So if you have three companies, it's three by three table. If you have two companies, it's two by two table. If you have n companies, it's n by n table. So this n by n table will have some diagonal elements, and these diagonal elements are easy to fill in. This is just the proportion that you invest into company number one to the square times the variance, or standard deviation of company one to the square. In the second diagonal element, you would put proportion that you invest into company two to the square times the standard deviation of the company two to the square. Now, the last element of these diagonal elements will be proportion that you invest into this company number n to the square times the variance of this company or standard deviation of this company to the square. OK? These are diagonal elements. They are simple. Now, these of diagonal elements, they are there to capture the fact that you also care about how companies move together. When one company goes up, 
the other company goes down and stuff like that. You want to know how do they move together. And I gave you the example. Imagine you are investing into two companies that move into opposite direction. That would kill lots of your risk. But if they move jointly together, that is not killing your risk. So different, com different correlations will have different influences on the final risk. And we said, this is how you do it. This is a recipe. And recipe is quite simple. So the element in this table, which is in column one, row two, is there to capture this joint co-movement, this covariance between company one and company two. This is why it is column one, row two. And what, how do you calculate it? You multiply proportion that you invest into company one times the proportion that you invest into company two times the correlation coefficient that measures this co-movement times the standard deviation of company one times the standard deviation of company two. So this, w is just the this is just the way. This is just like 10% that you invest in, for example. So for example, W1 can be 10%. This is percentage of your money that you have invested into company one. And it comes from weight. It's a portfolio weight. This is a percentage of your money that you invest. <laughs> raw, this raw with the index one, two, this third element in this equation, this is a Greek letter raw. Okay? This is a correlation coefficient. This sigma one, sigma two, these are standard deviations. Standard deviation of company one, standard deviation of company two. And this row tells us how much these companies somehow move together. Okay? And this same element would go into cell in the row one, column number two. So row one, column two, and column one, row two, contain exactly the same element. Okay? Now. Mm. Uh, sorry. Yes? Very quick. Who comes up with the correlation coefficient? I mean, how is that even possible? It seems to be super. It's very easy to calculate. I will show you later. Because how can you know that? Uh, you calculate it from the data. I will show you just a little bit later. I will show you just a little bit later. It's very easy to calculate, actually. Okay. Now, what comes, what goes into this cell? What goes into this cell? This is column number one, row number three. So this element is there to capture joint co-movement between company number one and company number three. So it will be proportion that you invest into company number one. This is W1 times proportion that you invest into company number three, this is W3, times the correlation coefficient between company one and three, times the standard deviation of company one, times the standard deviation of the company three. And this same element would go to a cell which is in column three and row number one. These are the same, this cell contains exactly the same elements. They are there to capture the joint co-movement of stock number one and stock number three. Okay. Now, what goes into this cell? Well, this is cell which is column number two, row number three. This is cell is there to capture co-movement between stock number two and stock number three. So, it will be proportion of your money invested into stock number two. So this is, let's say, 10% or 5%, however, I don't know how much you invest into this cell, times proportion that you invest into company three, times the correlation coefficient between the company two and company three, times standard deviation of stock two, times standard deviation of stock three. And exactly the same element will be in the cell, which is in the column number three and row number two. And we can continue filling in these matrices using this logic completely. We can fill in this matrix completely now. We know the logic be behind the filling this matrix. You can fill in every element. You just need to know how much of how many percents do you invest into each stock. You need to know standard deviation of each stock. This is what we know how to calculate. And we need to know how to calculate this correlation coefficient. So this, 
No, no, no. Look, this formula will work for any portfolio. For com portfolio consisted on n stocks. If it consists of two stocks, your matrix will just be two by two. If, it, if you invest into three stocks, your ma matrix will be three by three. If you invest into 10 different companies, this table will be of the size 10 by 10. And you just need to fill it in. Once you fill this in and calculate all these elements, how much they are, what are these numbers in these cells? Then you add them up together, and this will be the variance of your portfolio. And square root of it will be the standard deviation of your portfolio. This will be the measure of risk of your portfolio. Okay? Now let's, let's observe a little bit closely this table. Let's analyze this table a little bit. So, first of all, variance of portfolio will be just the sum of all elements in this table, nothing more than that. We now know how to calculate every element in this table. We know what are diagonal elements and what are dia of diagonal elements. Okay? I mean, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. of company one times proportion of company three times correlation coefficients times standard deviation one times standard deviation three and what actually do we get as a result? Number. A number. A number. And y when you add all these numbers, when you calculate all these numbers together, okay. this will be the variance of your portfolio. Okay. So the square root will be... For example. That's your risk, exactly. So, let's try to analyze this table more closely. Look at this picture. It's a matrix of the size n by n. If you invest only in two companies, it's two by two. So, if you, if you invest into two stocks, we said this is how you calculate your portfolio variance. You have these two diagonal elements, which are proportion into stock one to the square times the pro times the standard deviation of stock 1 to the square plus proportion into stock 2 to the square times standard deviation of stock 2 to the square. So we have basically what we can observe if we invest only into two companies we will have two diagonal elements plus two of diagonal elements. So this is where it comes from this two times something because we have two of diagonal elements which are exactly the same. Okay. Now, the question is, if, if you invest into 100 stocks, what is the number of diagonal elements? 100. Exactly, you have 100 elements on the diagonal. Now, what is the total number of elements in this table then? 100 times 100. This is 10,000. So how many of the diagonal elements do you have? 10,000 minus 100. Exactly. So then there are 100 diagonal elements and many more of the diagonal elements. Now, you can already guess where I'm shooting at. I'm shooting at the following thing. As you increase number of stocks in your portfolio, there are many more of diagonal elements than the diagonal elements. Okay? This is obvious because at the beginning when you have only two stocks, you have two diagonal and two of the diagonal elements. Now as you increase number of, uh, number of stocks that you invest into, you have much, much more of the diagonal than the diagonal elements. So in a sense, I'm trying to tell you is that as you increase number of stocks in your portfolio, actually risk of each stock which is captured by you see proportion that you invest into it times its own standard deviation times its own standard deviation to the square you see diagonal elements are those that capture only standard deviation of a company variance of a company of a specific company so cell number one diagonal cell will be related only to the specific risk of a company number one. It will be proportion that you invest into company one to the square times the variance of this company. The second element in 
diagonal will be proportion that you invest into company two to the square times its own risk in a sense. So diagonal elements will be only company specific in a sense. And you see as you increase the size of your portfolio, at the end for the risk of the total portfolio, the specific ri company risk matters less and less as you increase the size of this portfolio. Because you know when you add all these numbers together, these diagonal elements will be just a small proportion of the total thing. And now let me try to prove this to you more. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but the point is, doesn't matter. Whatever correlation coefficient is, as you increase number of stocks, there are less and less the the ratio of diagonal versus of diagonal is getting more in favor of of diagonal elements. So no matter whatever correlation coefficient is, there and there is some. There is always some. It's not zero, because we know that when we are in a crisis, everything goes down. When we are out of the crisis, everything goes up. So we see these market movements all, all the time. So there is some correlation. It's not zero. As long as the correlation is not zero, we can say that influence of the company-specific risk, as you increase the number of companies in your portfolio, is decreasing. And now we will, we will get to that. So <coughs> if we invest into N stocks, how many diagonal elements do we have? This is N. How many of diagonal elements do we have? N to the square minus N. Exactly. We have N to the square minus N of diagonal elements. So see, portfolio variance will be sum of all these N diagonal elements plus the sum of these of diagonal elements. And these are N to the square minus N. Okay? So this is not a product of two numbers. This is also that somebody called me. This is not n time diagonal elements. This is sum of n diagonal elements. So we will sum n diagonal elements. Okay. Now let's try to think more about this problem. And now imagine what happens when we invest into N stocks? So we said, if we invest into N stocks, portfolio variance will be sum of all N diagonal elements plus sum of N to the square minus N of diagonal elements. But now let's do one thought experiment. Let's assume, let's assume just for a moment that in all these N companies, you invest the same proportion of your money. So you are investing exactly the same proportion into each company, same amount of money. You have $100, you have 100 companies, in each company you invest $1, okay? This is the assumption. We invest equal amount of money into each company in our portfolio. Now, what is our portfolio weight going to be? What is W? W1. How much do we invest into W1? One over N. Exactly. You invest 1 over N. So if you invest $100 into, into 100 companies, you will invest 1% into each company. Okay? So you invest 1 over N. You agree? So in percents, this is a percent, this is a fraction. You will invest 1 over N into each company. Now, let's try to think what this sum of n diagonal elements will become in this case. So we have n elements and each of them is 1 over n to the square times the variance. And we have to sum, sum this up, okay? So, but let's represent that in the terms of average variance. Let's represent this in the terms of average variance. So this will basically be n times portfolio weight to the square, which is the same, which is 1 over n to the square, times the average variance. 
this is just like the sum of all elements, okay? You have n of them, average one has a value of average variance, times one over n to the square, okay? You understand where this formula comes from? Okay, let me try to explain briefly. So this n is comes from the fact that this is a sum of n numbers. So sum of n numbers, let's say, sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3, okay? Can you say that 1 plus 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2, 3 times the average value? Okay? You follow me? We will we will take the, the the rest of diagonal a bit just in a second. Okay. So this is just the first part. This is the sum of the diagonal elements because they are more similar because they are only variance times weight to the square. And you know th th every element in this diagonal because we invest now the same amount in each of them is one over n to the square because one over n is w is how much you invest and w to the square is one over n to the square. Now this is times average variance. This is like 1 plus 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. 3 times the average value, okay? So you understand where this comes from now? This is, the s this is what the sum of all the diagonal elements will be equal to. You will have n of them. On average they will have an average variance. And the weight for every of them will be 1 over n to the square, okay? Now, for of the diagonal elements, how many of them do we have? We have n to the square minus n of them. And what is the shape of this of diagonal element? How does the of diagonal element look like? It's Proportion that you invest into one company times proportion that you invest in the second company, for example, times the correlation coefficient times standard deviation times the standard deviation. So they have this, what you invest in company one times what you invest into company two. But you invest the same amount. So W1 times W2 is what? It's 1 over n to the square. What is W1 times W10? It's 1 over n to the square. It's the same. You invest the same proportion into every company. So, again, we can say something like this. Number of elements times this weight plus this average covariance. So, correlation coefficient times standard deviation times standard deviation. This is covariance. This is what is called covariance. You know that from your statistics class. So, standard deviation times... Standard deviation times correlation coefficient, this is covariance. Let's call this part covariance term, whatever that is. Doesn't matter, this is something. And this will be average covariance. And now let's rearrange these things a little bit. So what is n times 1 over n to the square? What? <laughs> Come on, n divided by n over square, what is that? It's 1 over n. So n times 1 over n to the square is 1 over n. Okay? So the first term will become 1 over n times the average variance. The second term, just divide n to the square by n to the square. This is 1 minus n times 1 over n to the square is 1 over n. Okay? Is this clear? No. Okay. So you see this, n to the square minus n times 1 over n everything to the square. Now, this 1 over n everything to the square is 1 over n to the square. So, n to the square times 1 over n to the square is 1. Minus n times 1 over n to the square is 1 over n. But now observe what happens as you increase n. If n gets larger and larger, what happens with the first term in this sum? It goes to zero. 
And this is what we were hoping to prove. So as n gets larger and larger, first element just goes to zero. The second element goes to some average covariance, whatever that is, because one over n will go to zero, so we will be left with one times average covariance. It approaches average covariance. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? We learn as we increase our portfolio, actually, if you add one more stock to this portfolio, standard deviation of this stock is not really what is important. It's important how this stock moves together with the rest of the stocks. Actually, of the diagonal elements are what matter more when your portfolio gets large. The diagonal elements are not really that important. OK. And this is what we see on this chart. This chart tells us one very simple thing that we have now proved, actually. This chart tells us one thing that we have proved, which is actually obvious if you think. You don't even need to prove it if you think about it. Now let's do a thought experiment with this chart in which we will prove exactly the same thing that we have proven just a second ago using a bit complex math. So this chart tells you how the portfolio risk measured by the standard deviation is changing if you increase number of stocks in your portfolio. So more stocks you have, and the blue line is approaching this market risk. So blue line tells you what is the risk of your portfolio. So if you invest into three stocks, you will have some what we call unique risk. But as you increase number of stocks, the riskiness of your portfolio is approaching the market risk. I mean, your portfolio becomes more and more similar to the portfolio in which you would invest in every company in the market. This is what it means, which makes sense. Imagine, why is this kind of important? Imagine, like 10 or 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, Procter & Gamble, they chose the elected chief executive officer, which was kind of crazy. And people figured it out quite fast, and the company has lost like, I don't know, 60% of its value over like two months. Or you can have a more e recent example with the EBS. <laughs> <coughs> now, what does it mean? Imagine that you invest your money only into Procter & Gamble. You invest 100% of every, so everything you have, you invest into Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble loses 60% of its money over two months. Well, you will lose a lot of money. But imagine that you have invested into 100 different companies, into each company the same amount of money. You had $100, and in each company you have invested $1. And let's say that the, the that in Procter & Gamble, you have invested also $1. And now, let's say that Procter & Gamble totally went out of the market, totally crashed, lost everything. But you have lost only 1% of your money. And this is the company-specific risk. You know, CEO is a company-specific risk because he is not CEO of Procter & Gamble and Microsoft at the same time. It's difficult to imagine something like that. So as we increase number of companies in our portfolio, we are losing this unique risk. This unique risk goes away. It disappears. Unique risk disappears. You don't have unique risk if you invest into many companies. This company-specific risk goes away. And your portfolio risk is approaching the market risk. And actually, it turns out that you don't have to invest into 100 companies to, to replicate the portfolio. You can do it easily by investing into indexes like Standard & Poor's 500, which includes 500 companies. But even by investing into 20 companies, you can get rid of this bad risk, this unique risk. So everything that is left here is what is called a market risk. If you invest into 20 companies, you are left only with the market risk. You do not suffer from this company idiosyncratic movement. Now. What is this market risk? What did you say again? You're not suffering from this company? 
company idiosyncratic risk, this company specific risk, this risk that is very specific to a company, uh, like CEO risk, or whatever that is specific only to that company. As I mean, as soon as you are invested into 20 companies, you are already well diversified. This is what it's called. You have diversified your risk. When you invest into 20 companies, there is very little company specific risk that you, you are carrying. And this is what we have observed here. As N grows, this company specific variance, company specific risk becomes unimportant. This first element, 1 over n times average variance, becomes very small. It disappears as n grows. And you end up basically just with average co-movement. The only thing is how these things move together. Now, how do these things move together? This is how they move together. This is the movement of stocks from 1926 to 2010, if you have invested into all companies. This green line tells you this is what I get if I invest some amount of money into all companies. So this is how they move together. This is this, is this, this, is this market risk that we observe. How do we measure this market risk? Well, easily. This is the width of this distribution. Okay? This is the width of this distribution. So we know what level of risk we can achieve if we invest into many companies. This is the level of risk. Now, but imagine now that you know this, what I have told you. That would mean that you would basically never invest into one company alone. It doesn't make any sense to invest into just one company. Because you will have some amount of risk of which you can get rid of easily by investing into more companies. Okay? But now, let's think about what would then be the appropriate measure of riskiness of company if you were holding a market portfolio. Because if you are rational, if you are rational, you will hold something like a well diversified portfolio. You want to get rid of all this bad risk. Now, if you get rid of all this bad risk, and for example, you are investing into 30 companies, and now you observe the stock of IBM. You are observing a stock of IBM. And you are considering, should I buy this stock or should I not buy this stock? What will then be the measure of riskiness of this company for you? It won't be any more standard deviation because standard deviation of a stock is a measure of riskiness of a company for a person that holds only that stock. But now you're holding a portfolio. Now you want to know, okay, if I add this stock to my portfolio, how much my risk will change? It's it's similar to correlation coefficient, but it's more sophisticated. Why? Because correlation coefficient tells you how they move together. But you know, if company A jumps 10% and Microsoft jumps 10%, this will be the same correlation coefficient as if company jumps 10% and market jumps 100%. Let me, let me get to it. It will be just a slightly bit more complex. It's not correlation coefficient. It's called beta. It's a sensitivity of a stock's return to the return on the market of portfolio. It's related to the correlation coefficient. It's actually correlation coefficient times something divided by something. We will see. OK, so what is beta? Well, you know that from your statistics class. Or you should know that from your statistics class. Let's use the conditional tense. OK, so imagine that I plot on this chart returns of IBM in respect to return on the market. These are some dots. Okay, so what do these dots represent? Imagine first dot, imagine this dot. But this is what I say, this is a true value. All these dots are observed values. This is what we have observed in the history. This is what has happened. We know these things. So let's observe this point. This point means that, I don't know, let's say two months ago, the market return was 10%. When the market return was 10%, in the same moment of time, IBM was giving you 7%. 
this dot over here means that when market return was minus 9%, let's say this was three months ago or 10 months ago or whatever, this is something that happened in the past. When market was losing 9%, then in this moment of time, Microsoft gained, uh, mic IBM lost 1%, okay? And you plot these dots. Now what you want to do is to find the best fit line. You want to find the line that will best describe this relationship. And you do it by using linear regression. So basically the idea is to find the, to find the equation that describes this line. The idea is, let's find the equation that describes this line. So what does it mean to find the equation? Find A and beta. A and beta such that, you see, if I plug in this number, if I give you, okay, my return market is, re my return on market is 3%. What is the most likely return on the stock of IBM? Well, most likely by this line is 5%. Now, this is what we call a predicted value. So this 5% is predicted value, okay? This 5% is a predicted value. Conditional that the return is 3, this line predicts that return on IBM will be 5%. This is clear. Now, the distance between these points is what we call the residual error. This is how much we have missed for what we have actually observed. This residual error tells us, okay, we are approximating this data by this line. We are approximating relationship between return on the market and return on IBM with this line. And these blue dots are what actually happened. And for, for let's say, this 3%, for this 3%, we have predicted 5. But in reality, when market was giving three, more has happened. You see, this blue dot is above this red dot. And this error that we make is called residual error. So we are actually trying to find A and B in such a way that we will minimize some of the square of these residuals. So we take this epsilon, this epsilon, all epsilons, put them to the square and minimize it. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is true. And we will you would have to correct for these things. This is what you call you have changes in volatility. You have many different problems that normal regression cannot deal with. But this is out of the scope of this class. And this turns out to be a really good approximation. But we are still not predicting anything. We are still not predicting any. We are still in the present. We will be predicting soon, but let's not get distracted with these small technical details. These are small technical details, believe me. Because we will see that we are actually able to predict 98% of the things, but this will s we will see in the next class. We are very good in predicting things, actually, by using this methodology. Okay. So, what is the idea of the linear regression? First, you find A. What is A doing to your regression line? If, if you describe some line as A times A plus, A plus B times X, A plus beta times X, A will move your line up and down vertically in parallel way. So, you first choose A, that is minimizing some of the square of the residual. So these vertical bars connecting observed dots with the line, these are your residuals. And you want to minimize some of their squares. And you fix A that, is, that gives you the minimal value. Then you are changing the slope of the curve, keeping A fixed. You have, you have chosen the best A, and now you are trying different Bs to betas to find the slope of this line. Once you have found, found A and beta, you are done. And you have learned in your statistics class how to do it. 
I will show you how to do it quickly a bit later, but what I want to show you is actually how it looks with the real data. So this was downloaded two days ago. I have downloaded return on the market and return on the Microsoft in the same periods of time. And these are these blue dots. The blue dots tell you, you okay, when market was giving me this, Microsoft stock was giving me this return, okay. And now I try to approximate this with the line. And I calculate the regression line. And it turns out that this regression line is given by this equation. Okay, now let's concentrate on this 1.3. This is beta, this is what is important. This is what I'm saying is the measure of the riskiness of your company for a person that is holding a well diversified portfolio. Now why? Imagine what is this beta telling you? Think about it in the following way. If market goes up by one percentage point, then Microsoft stock will go up by 1.3 percentage points, okay? If market goes down by one percentage point, Microsoft will go down by 1.3 percentage points. So, what is this, if you invest your money into a market portfolio and Microsoft stock, what will happen with your portfolio? It will increase your risk. You're holding a market portfolio. And now you have invested your money into something that is moving more than market, okay? It has beta higher than one. So if you mix market portfolio and stock of Microsoft, what, what do you get? Well, if you invest it just in market portfolio, what is beta of market? It's one, because when market moves one, market moves one. This is clear, it should be one. So, what is happening with the risk of your portfolio? Imagine, you have invested part of your money into something that, into market, and part of your money into Microsoft. And when market moves one, Microsoft moves to 1.3. When mi market moves down one, Microsoft moves 1.3. So it moves more to the extremes, in a sense. So beta tells you, in a sense, how the risk of your portfolio will change if you add this company into your into your portfolio. And now let's observe another stock, also real data, downloaded two days ago. Procter & Gamble. The regression line gives us this. Beta is 0 0.3. What does it mean? It means when market moves up 1%, Procter & Gamble moves up 0.3%. When market moves down 1%, Procter & Gamble moves down 0.3%. So what happens with the riskiness of your portfolio? It shrinks. So can you tell me which stock will give you more return, Procter & Gamble or Microsoft? Microsoft, because it's more risky. Otherwise, nobody would buy it. Nobody would buy Microsoft if it was offering the same return as as Procter & Gamble. Why? Because Procter & Gamble, if I buy, it will decrease my risk. Microsoft, if I buy, it will increase my risk. Therefore, Procter & Gamble has to offer me less re return. Microsoft should offer me more return. Okay, so how do we calculate this beta? I mean, this, not really, because this is not, this is not if it moves up by 1%. This is if it moves up by one percentage point. Because I'm ta saying by 1%, meaning if currently return of the market is 5%, and if return of the market jumps to 6%, so moves up by one percentage point, then Microsoft will move up by 1.3 percentage points, while the Procter & Gamble will move only 0.3 percentage points. So it's not elasticity, it's more like, I don't know, <laughs> number that you use to multiply something. <laughs> okay, please keep the noise level down. We are approaching the Nobel Prize in a fast way. 
So let's first understand what is beta and how do we calculate it. It turns out this is really simple thing to calculate. So what is beta? Beta is covariance of stock I with the market portfolio divided by the variance of the market. So in a sense, this is, this is beta of Microsoft is covariance of Microsoft with the market divided by the variance of the market. And this is the same thing as this thing over here. You should know that from your statistic class, but if you don't know, you can see it here. So somebody asked about the correlation coefficient. So beta is correlation coefficient between stock I and the market times standard deviation of stock I times standard deviation of the market divided by the variance of the market. Okay? So how do we calculate this in real life? How do you calculate beta in real life? You can do it easily. You can calculate beta of every stock easily. Let's say that you observe over last six months returns on the market. And let's say that the returns on the market over last six months, one month ago it was 8%, minus 8%, two months ago it was 4%, three months ago it was 12%, etc. Okay? You follow me? I think you specifically calculated better this consistency. How? Well, I doubt it. <laughs> I don't know. I would. I really doubt. I mean, this is very standard. I. I don't think that our prof our professors of statistics are so inventive to modify the standard things. <laughs> <laughs> But doesn't matter. I mean, this is not a statistic class, so do not focus on these details. Do not focus on these details. Details such as this are not so important. It's important that you understand what beta means and why is it a measure of risk. Okay, now I will show you how to work with this with the data. Maybe when you look at the data, maybe it will become clear. Maybe if you look at the data, it will become more clear. Let's see how it's calculated. So this is the market return over the last six months. And the average market return over the last six months is 2%. So the average market return is 2%, and this is what happened in the last six months. You were losing and gaining some percent. Now, this is what is deviation of the market return from its mean. So this is how far market return is from 2%. Okay? This column tells you how far away from the average you are in each observation. Now, these are returns of the IBM and their average. So this is what happened during the last six months with the return of the if you invested into IBM. And 2% is the average. By coincidence, it turned out to be the same. It doesn't have to be the same. Okay. Now, this is the deviation of the IBM return from the IBM mean. So this is how far of each observation is from the average return of the IBM. Okay? So how would we calculate the variance of the stock? How would we calculate the variance of the stock? Well, it would be squared deviation from average market return. This would be the variance. And this would be covariance, but let me tell you what this is. So how do we calculate this thing over here? How do we calculate this thing over here? Let's concentrate. So what's the variance? Variance will be the average square deviation, variance of the market, will be average square deviation from the mean. So these are, these column number three is deviation from average market return. So this is how much each observation of the market return was away from the average market return, okay? 
Now, if we put this column number three to the square, we will get we will get column number one, two, three, four, five, six. Column number six is square deviation of the market return. And now average, this is the variance. This is sum of these numbers divided by six because we have six observations. So this is the average, okay? So this thing is the variance of the market. Variance of the market is 50.67, okay? And now to calculate beta, we need covariance. Now what is covariance? Covariance is the average of the products of deviations of market from its mean and deviation of IBM return from its mean. So you see column, the last column is a product of column number three and column number five. Column number three are deviations of the market from its mean and column number five are deviations of IBM stock from its mean. So product of these two numbers and its average will be covariance of IBM with the market. This is how you calculate. So this is what you can calculate from the real data. You can calculate beta of IBM from real data. And in this example, if this was real data, you would get beta of 1.5. Beta of IBM is 1.5, okay? You understand how is this calculated? This is just the mechanics. You have a recipe. And now we come to something really, really, really important and interesting. And you will see that this slide is titled Markowitz Portfolio Theory. What does it mean? This means that we are approaching now the Nobel Prize in economics. The Nobel Prize that relates risk to return. The only Nobel Prize that you will learn in this school. And this is after seven lectures. Okay. So, imagine that company on the top, that these are the returns of some comp distribution of returns of, compa of some company. The, compa the chart on the bottom is distribution of the returns of some other company. Now, do you, would you rather invest into company on the top or in the company at the bottom. The bottom one, it offers you on average the same thing, but there is less risk, okay? So on average, they will give you the same stuff, but the company on the bottom has less risk, okay? Now, I mean, I'm telling you that the mean of these distributions is five. Both are centered around, around five, let's say. So uh, this is what I'm telling you from this chart. I mean, I try to make it look the same, but I don't know whether I have succeeded in that. It's not so easy. <laughs> okay. Then in the next chart, let's say that these two companies have the same standard deviation. Let's say that the risk is the same. Which one do you prefer, the one on top or one on the bottom? You prefer one on the bottom because it gives you more on average, okay? But now comes the tricky question. Do you prefer company on the top or company on the bottom? The one on top has more risk, the one on bottom has less risk, but one on the bottom has more return on average. Which one do you prefer? Well, you don't know. You cannot answer this question yet. There is no way you can answer this question yet because we still don't know what is the relationship between the risk and the return. And this is what Markowitz portfolio theory is going to tell us. We are now going to try to understand what is the connection between the risk and return to be able to answer these kind of questions. To compare more risky, less risky with more return, less return and stuff like that. Now we are going to our last class, example that I have given you in the last class. It was actually a very important example. If you remember, we had the following example. This is the chart in which I will plot the return versus risk measured as a standard deviation. So if you remember, we had in the previous class the following example. You have a Walmart company which offers you 10% of a return and it has a standard deviation of 22%. Then 
you also had Microsoft company, which had 15% return and 23% standard deviation. And we assumed for this example that the correlation coefficient is 0 0.8. It can be whatever, but let's say that it's 0 0.8, doesn't matter. <coughs> and then we said, okay, let's calculate what will happen if I invest 60% of my money into Walmart and 40% of my money into Microsoft. This was the example from the last class. So how do you calculate return of this portfolio? Return will be just 0 0.6 times 10% plus 0 0.4 times 15%. It turns out that this will be 12%. So this portfolio will have a return of 12%. Now, how much risk will this portfolio have? Well, we did it. We constructed this two by two table where we filled in diagonal elements and off diagonal elements, which would be in this case, proportion that you invest in Walmart, this is 0 0.6 to the square times the standard deviation of Walmart to the square. So this is 0 0.6 to the square times 0 0.22 to the square plus proportion that you invest into Microsoft. This is 0 0.4 to the square times standard deviation of Microsoft to the square. This is 0 0.23 to the square plus now we have two of diagonal elements, two times proportion in Microsoft times proportion in, I in Walmart times correlation coefficient, which was 0 0.8 times standard deviation of Microsoft times standard deviation of Walmart. That was it. And we calculated it and we obtained the value of 21.3%. And in this example, we said there was one very important observation. There was one very important observation. If you observe this red dot, this portfolio, it actually offers you more than s Walmart stock, but it also has less risk than Walmart stock. So in a sense, you strictly prefer this portfolio to Walmart. Now, we still cannot say whether this portfolio is better than Microsoft. We cannot say it. We don't know enough yet. But we know that we prefer this combination of stocks to Walmart because this combination has less risk and it offers more return. This is the best you can get. Now, if you try to invest, let's say, 50-50, 50% of your money to Walmart, 50% into... Why can't we say it's, um, Microsoft is better than um, the portfolio? Because it has more... It, no, Microsoft has more risk. It has risk of 23 and it has more return, it has 50, so we don't know yet whether this is better. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. We need to know the risk-return risk relationship to say something. So, so far we can compare, for we can compare things if they have, if they have, let's say, same risk and more return, then we prefer more return. Or if they have same return, less risk, we prefer uh, less risk. Or even clear case like this, when they have more return and less risk. This is the best combination that you can get. Okay, but now let's assume that we nest 50-50%. Let's say you get something like this. You get this risk-return correlation. Now let's say you, uh, you invest 60% you invest in Microsoft and 40% into Walmart. Let's say you get something like this. And as you invest more and more <coughs> in Microsoft and less and less in Walmart, you would approach Microsoft. Now you try all these combinations, different portfolio weights, you would get something like this. So basically, if you tried all possible combinations between Microsoft and Walmart, you would get some X-shaped curve like this. So by choosing different proportions that you invest in Walmart or Microsoft, you could achieve any point on this X-shaped curve. Well, if you invest everything into Walmart, you will get this number. You can check this number. This is not invented. You know, you see? Some point, you get one risk, two different yes. Well, the this, this will lead us actually to the development of the theory that we, we will say n this, c I mean, nobody would invest if something offers less. Nobody would invest into company that would offer less return for the same amount of risk. This is what is actually going to lead us to the Nobel Prize. Wait. So 
This is what you get if you mix Microsoft and Walmart with the data that you have been given. This is what you will get. Okay? I g uh, yeah, I just, s I mean, you can use any correlation coefficient. You will get basically the same thing basically with any correlation coefficient. Okay. Now let's, let's, I, and 0 0.8 is a normal correlation coefficient. There is nothing special about it. Let's make it clear. So, okay, by mixing Microsoft and Walmart, you can achieve this egg-shaped curve. Different proportion in different stock, you can achieve different risk return relationship. But now let's think about it in the following way. Imagine now you have invested, you have this portfolio, you can choose to invest into this portfolio, which is 60%, 60% Walmart, 40% Microsoft. And now let's say, let's add to this mix also stock of IBM. You know, that will mean that you can achieve anything on this egg-shaped curve. Is this clear? This is the same logic as before. Nothing has changed. And our goal is to move up and left. And you see these egg-shaped curves are moving us up and left, up and left. As soon as we mix, we are going up and left. And this is good. Why? Because up, there is more return. Left, there is less risk. So in a sense, this is a good quadrant, low risk, high risk. This one is also not bad. This is high risk, but it's also high return. This one is also not bad, but this one is really bad. High risk, low return, you don't want this. So imagine now, you have many stocks. You have many stocks to invest, many stocks. 10, 15 stocks, not only two. Now what I'm saying to you is that by observing these stocks, you can actually achieve any risk return combination which is in this shaded area and on this pink line. So you can achieve any risk, relation, risk return relationship which is on this shaded area and on this pink line. One can actually prove this. Math is complicated, but believe me, you can achieve any combination there. You can do it actually in Excel. In every manual for Excel that is used for teaching people finance and Excel, you have the exercise where you do this. This is not too complicated to do in Excel. So this shaded area, you can achieve any risk return combination. So my question to you is, would you ever invest into this stock? Why? Exactly. This is what you can observe on this chart. You can invest in a portfolio that generates this pink point, this pink point, and for the same amount of risk. You see, this is same amount of risk, same standard deviation as this company, you will achieve better return. And this goes basically for every point which is inside this pink, pink curve. And this is why this slide is called efficient frontier. You see, for this thing, you can achieve any, you can achieve, for this combination, you can achieve more return by going to this pink line. And now, I have d done this with like 10 companies, but you can repeat the same exercise with like all companies in the stock market. And try all the possible combinations and you will get, believe me, this efficient frontier. There will be set of efficient portfolios. There are, these are the most efficient portfolios that you can achieve. So on this black line, we call it efficient frontier. These are the best risk return, best risk return combinations that you can achieve by investing into stocks. They are the most optimal. So now, the, now comes the story, okay. Do you love risk or don't you love risk? That doesn't mean that you are risk loving. Are you less or more risk averse would be the best question. So if you are less risk averse, you would invest into, let's say, some point over here. If you are more risk averse, you would invest into some point which is more to the right on the efficient frontier. So what is the idea here? There are portfolios that are better than the others. And they are all on this efficient frontier. They all offer you 
the best risk return combination that you can achieve. Now let's get back to our drawing table. So this was our combination portfolio. If we add IBM, you know, we move it toward this efficient frontier. This is how we actually reconstruct efficient frontier. We try all these combinations, we mix everything, and we are moving things toward the efficient frontier. And everything will be inside this efficient frontier. And now, this is if we invest only into stocks. Now, in order to get to the Nobel Prize, we need to understand one more thing. What happens if you invest into stocks and bonds? You invest part of your money into stocks and part of your money into bonds. This is the last thing that we need to basically understand to get to the Nobel Prize. And it's simple. It's much more simple than, than portfolio of stocks alone. So imagine now that you want to mix your investment between IBM and bonds. And we are still plotting return versus standard deviation. So where are bonds going to be? Bonds have zero risk. Why? U.S. government can always print money. We will never lose if we buy bonds of U.S. governments. <laughs> if you buy Greek bonds, well, the situation is a bit different. But if you buy U.S. government bonds, there is zero risk, let's say. And this we are talking about these things. So where is going to in this chart where is in this chart is going to be the government bond investment it will be it will have risk zero and it will offer you some rate of return let's say that this is this point rf rf stands for risk free rate this is the rate at which you can invest with no risk and these things exist you usually consider this is either in a bank or government bonds or whatever but this is kind of a riskless investment Okay, and you have, let's say, stock of IBM, which is somewhere there. It has standard deviation and it has some, some return. Now, the question is the following. If you invest part of your money into risk-free assets, into bonds, and part of your money into IBM, what is going to be the return and the standard deviation of such portfolio? Let's observe. Return is very easy to calculate. It will be just the weighted average, like with the stocks. There is no difference. Now, with the, with the variance, with the risk, it will be slightly different. The formula will be the same. So we will have proportion that you invest into IBM to the square times standard deviation of IBM to the square plus proportion into bonds to the square times standard deviation of the bonds to the square plus to these two of the of the diagonal elements but note one thing standard deviation of the bond risk of a bond in this case is zero we consider bonds riskless so this element over here which contains standard deviation of the bonds will be zero because it contains zero the second element will also be zero okay so what is the risk of this portfolio? Well, portfolio variance will be just this element over here, just the first element. What is the standard deviation? Well, this is the standard deviation, it's just the square root of that. So what you can observe, we have lost all these complicated things, square root of the whole thing upstairs. And this square root of this whole thing upstairs was giving us this egg-shaped thing. This is why we had egg-shaped thing. Now we won't have X-shaped thing anymore. It will be just be the straight line because this is a linear combination, nothing more. This is just a normal linear combination like returns. Now standard deviations become in a sense like returns when you mix them with something riskless. And what can you observe? The first point, let's say you invest 90% of your money into bonds and 10% into IBM will be here. If you invest 80% into bonds, 20% into IBM will be here. And you continue changing this mix, this will be just on a straight line. Now imagine one thing, that the borrowing and the lending rate are the same, that you can actually borrow money at this risk-free rate. What will happen then? Then you will be able, let's say, you have $100 and you borrow $10, then you will be basically able to invest 1.1 of what you have. So portfolio weight will be 1.1, in a sense. 
So you will be able to reach to this point. If you, borrow if you borrow even more and invest into IBM, you will reach this point. Uh, can you repeat that? So it will become clear when, when I draw the complete. So this is what you get when you mix IBM stock and bonds, this part. You can achieve any combination between these two points. Now, what you also can do if you can borrow at the same rate, at the risk-free rate, you go to a bank and ask them, okay, can you, I have $100 and I want to invest them into IBM. And, they and you ask, could I borrow $50 more? They tell you, okay, no problem, but in a year from now, you will have to repay us a risk-free rate on that. You say, no problem. So you borrow $50 and you invest now $150 into stock of IBM. And then you will move to the right on this chart, on this line. So you will be somewhere here. You will be somewhere here because you will have you will take more risk on you because it will be like you have invested more than you have. And but we will see this through the examples in the homework and in the next class. It will this part of the line will be more clear when we do examples. And we now don't want to waste more time on it. But the idea is more depth you take, more risky in a sense you get because you have to repay the debt and you have so risk will increase, but also re expected return will increase because you want ex you are calculating return on what you have, and you have let's say one hundred dollars. So your return will be higher because you will be investing one hundred and fifty dollars. It will be this part of the line will become more clear when we do examples next class. But for now, believe me that everything on the right hand side of the IBM stock is achieved on this it, it will be on the same line but if you borrow money and invest everything you have plus what you have borrowed into stock of IBM okay now let's observe what happens what this implies now let's get back to our efficient frontier we have now mixed bonds and IBM stock but now let's mix we know that it's not efficient to mix IBM stock. Let's mix the most efficient things, which are efficient portfolios. This is, let's say, this red line is our efficient frontier. These are the most efficient combinations of risk and return. But note now this. There is one portfolio that will be by far the superior one which is the tangent portfolio of this efficient line. What do I mean by this? You observe this point where this black line is intersecting the efficient frontier, where it's just touching it. So if we mix this portfolio and the bonds, we will be able to achieve everything on this line, okay? And everything between risk-free rate and the tangent point on this black line will be superior to this efficient frontier. So if you invest, if you invest part of your money into this portfolio that is tangential and part of your money into risk-free rate, you can achieve everything on this black line between the risk-free rate and, and this tangent point, which is more better combination and gives you higher return for the same, re same level of risk than the things below the than the things on the efficient frontier. So there is one, and notice also that if you borrow money and you invest into this tangent portfolio, you can achieve everything above to the right on this black line. Do you follow me? So on the left hand side here, as you are approaching the risk free, you are having more bonds. If you are just at this tangent point, you have invested everything into your into this efficient portfolio. So that's you, um, borrow money. So here, from here, you borrow money. I, I will make this drawing. So from this tangent point, you borrow money and invest everything into this tangent portfolio. So there is this super efficient portfolio. Why is this portfolio better than any other on this drawing? Well, imagine that I wanted to invest into some 
portfolio on the efficient frontier which is below this portfolio. If we connect these two points, this will obviously be less than what this portfolio offers. Um, when I'm on the line between AI and the interception point, okay. I'm the half of the point, you half on, on the line, um, I got like 50% on bonds and 50% exactly. on okay. Exactly. And if you are on the right hand side of this point, then you borrow money at the rate of risk free and you invest everything you have and what you have borrowed into exactly this portfolio. Okay. And now what I will try to argue is actually that it's very easy to conclude that this is the market portfolio. Now let me try to argue that the efficient portfolio is actually the market portfolio. Let's do one thought experiment. Let's think. <coughs> Let's think just a little bit more and we are at the Nobel Prize. This is the Nobel Prize derivation, people. We are here, we are just there. Once I, pr once I, now I need to convince you that this efficient portfolio, so among these many portfolios at the efficient frontier, there is the one that is the best. And by combining this best portfolio with investing in bonds, you can beat any other portfolio. Okay? Now, what I want to argue is that this portfolio is actually a market portfolio. Keep the noise down. Imagine that we are all the investors on the planet. Nobody but us is investor. And you know, you have been in this class. So you know, that there is one portfolio which is the best. So everybody would like to invest into this portfolio because this is by far the best risk return combination. So no matter which level of risk you want to take on yourself, this you will just mix this portfolio with bonds or borrow money if you want even more risk and invest into this portfolio. But this portfolio is what we all want to invest. Now. That means that we all invest into the same thing. If we all invest into the same thing, I claim that this efficient portfolio must be market portfolio. Why? Well, imagine that there are only three stocks in the market. And I say, okay, my efficient portfolio is not that I invest in all three stocks. I will, inv I will invest only in two stocks. Then, I mean, there is only one efficient portfolio. This one is for me and for you and for everybody, no matter what level of risk you want to take on. So you will invest also into these two stocks. But then what happens with this stock that is left? Nobody owns it. It disappears. <coughs> so it's gone from the market. So our market is now two stocks. So we are investing into market portfolio. Because if we were not all investing in all stocks, since we are all investing the same amount of money, then somebody, some stocks would end up owned by nobody, which is not the case. I mean, we observe that this is not the case. As soon as stock exists, it's owned by somebody. And this is the rationale that this is the market portfolio. Now, what kind of market portfolio it is? It turns out, and it's really easy to prove, and we will talk about that in the next class, that this is actually what is called the value-weighted market portfolio, where in each stock, you invest the uh, proportion of your wealth which is proportional to the value of this company compared to the total market. Because if it was not like that, this would not sum up. We would not buy all the parts of every company. We will talk about that in the next class a little bit. But this is a value-weighted market portfolio. Now, now we are there, people. We just need to do one more thing. So this is, this is, this first part says this is the mix of market portfolio bonds and fraction ma market portfolio and bonds. The second part is borrow money at risk free rate and invest into market portfolio. Now, let's switch. S you see, so far I have been plotting return versus standard deviation. Now let's plot this on a chart of return versus beta. And we are done. This is the Nobel Prize. 
And what is the Nobel Prize here? We know what is the beta of market portfolio. It's one. You see? Beta of market portfolio is one. Therefore, we know two points through which this line, which we call security market line, goes through. So this line goes through risk-free rate, which is at zero and risk-free. X coordinate is zero, Y coordinate is risk-free. And this other point is beta equal to one and return on the market, okay? And by looking at this line, we can conclude what is the equation that describes this line. And this line is described by the following equation. How can you check that this equation describes this line? I mean, you should know from your high school how to de derive the line of the equation that goes through two points. But you can do it even just by checking this equation. What is the value of this equation if beta is equal to zero? What is the value of this equation if beta is equal to zero? What is the value of this equation if beta is equal to one? It will be Rf plus Rm minus Rf. It will be Rm. So this equation must cross through these two points. Therefore, this is the equation of this line. This is clear. And now try to understand the power of this equation. Now try to understand. Let's interpret this equation in the following way. Would you ever, ever invest in a company that would offer you this risk return combination? No, no because you can get more by investing into this thing over here. And this leads us to the fact that this equation is one of the most powerful equations in the world. Would you ever sold this company? No. no. And this equation, so for any level of risk, let's say you want to achieve this level of risk, you can achieve this level of risk by mixing market portfolio and risk-free. So you mix these two things and you can achieve this level of risk. So for any level of risk, this equation works. For any beta that you want to take on, this works. And now we come to the equation which tells us every stock return must satisfy this equation. This is CAPM. This is Capital Asset Pricing Model. This is the Nobel Prize. And it tells you every stock return has to satisfy this equation. This is the equation from the previous slide. It tells you for a beta of a company, for a beta of a stock I, it must have a return that satisfies this equation. Because if it does not satisfy this equation, this would be the stock that would be off the chart. That would be this stock. And nobody would buy it. Therefore, every stock has to satisfy this equation. So this is our risk-return relationship. You calculate the risk of a company by calculating its beta. You can do it from the data. You plug it into this. And you know what investors expect if they invest into this company. And that's it. This is the risk-return relationship. This is the Nobel Prize. 